Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining our BOF Live today. You are joining us for Gen Z and fashion in the age of realism. Our BOF community is a global one, so please don't be shy. Feel free to enter in your location of where you are tuning in from today. I'm based in London, and my name is Diana Lee. I'm the Director of Research and Analysis at BOF Insights. And BOF Insights is the newest team within the business of fashion. We're the internal data unit and the think tank for the company. And our mission is to be able to arm fashion and creative leaders with the business intelligence that they need in order to make better business decisions. And I hope many of you on the call today are already familiar with our existing work, whether that's related to the future of fashion resale or the opportunity in digital fashion and avatars, or our first product category report, which we published this summer, which was on designer handbags. So today I'm delighted to be facilitating this conversation with my colleague and my co-author on the Gen Z and fashion report, Benjamin Schneider. In addition, I'm delighted to have three panelists with us today. And these three panelists have been integral to the creation of this report. So we're very thankful for their collaboration on either the provision of data and analysis or from their insights and perspectives. So needless to say, I am very, very excited about the conversation that is going to ensue. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the three panelists. I have with me Anurag Banerjee, who is the founder and CEO of Quilt AI. We have Craig Brommers, the CMO of American Eagle, and also finally Shaina Zafar, who who is the co-founder and CMO of Juve Consulting. So welcome to all three of you. Before we get started, I wanted to give the chance for each of you to introduce yourselves and also to talk a little bit about your companies. So let's do this in order of introductions. So Anurag, first for you, then Craig, and then Shaina. Thanks, Diana. Hi, everyone. I saw that someone from Columbus, Ohio signed this. That's epic. That's where I spent some of my life. But I'm Anurag Banerjee. I work at Quilt AI. We're an interpreter of the internet. We're a small company, we're about 250 people across 19 countries. Very excited to be here. Hey everyone, I'm Craig from American Eagle. American Eagle is the number one specialty retailer for Gen Z here in North America, although our footstep across the globe is getting bigger. In fact, we just opened a huge flagship in Shibuya in Tokyo this week. So excited to continue to expand our presence. We're also the number one seller of jeans here in America for all ages. Hi everyone, I'm Shaina, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, super excited to be here. So thank you to BOF for making this happen and to be in wonderful company with you all. I work at Juve, which is a purpose-driven Gen Z marketing company where we're entirely led by young people 14 to 26. We definitely have a few adults in the room that are millennials, but our work is meant to work with brands, nonprofits, Fortune 500s and startups to help them understand young people under this narrative about talking to us directly rather than talking about us. So super excited to dive into conversation with you. Well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Now, Benjamin, over to you. Perfect. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Benjamin Schneider, and I'm the senior research lead here at BOF Insights, and I'm based in New York. So before we get started, I'm going to quickly take us through a couple of administrative points, um, and then we're going to get started. So if you have a question for our panelists, please submit it by clicking the Q&A button in the bottom toolbar of your Zoom window. Um, please do be sure to use this Q&A button and not the chat function for any specific questions you may have, um, as we might not see questions that come through um, through the chat. But otherwise, please do use the chat to share any comments or reactions um, or anything that you want to, you know, just get off your chest um, with the rest of the audience. And lastly, if you have any other um, support needs during the event, please contact our customer support team at events at businessoffashion.com because they're standing by and they're ready to help. So to begin today, I'm gonna to be taking us through a brief presentation of some modified slides and high-level highlights from our latest report. Um, and then we're gonna be moving into the moderated portion of our conversation before ending with a few minutes for audience Q&A. So Gen Z is really coming into its own. This generation ranges from age 12 to 25 which means that they will become increasingly influential on the culture and the economy. Gen Zers make up about 25% of the world's population and 20% of the population in the US, where we found that they have a purchasing power of 360 billion US dollars. Gen Z is already entering the workforce, they're setting new fashion styles, and they're shifting the buying behavior of all generations. Because of this, our team at BOF Insights wanted to decode Gen Zers' relationship with fashion, and we focused on the US given its influence on youth culture across the globe. To do this, we identified six distinct personality clusters of US Gen Zers 
by analyzing public social media profiles in partnership with Honorox company, Quilt AI. We also uncovered their sources of inspiration, their preferred brands, and their approach to fashion from ultra fast to secondhand through focus groups with the Z Suite and with China's company, Juve Consulting. And we also fielded a survey of nearly a thousand US Gen Zers with Juve as well. So when we studied each of the recent US generations, we defined a prevailing attitude of each that was shaped by the most impactful social and ac economic events of their formative years. For example, we found that millennials defined an age of idealism because they witnessed the growth of the internet and social media, but at the same time, they're old enough to remember a less connected world. On the other hand, Gen Zers are the first true digital natives. They've always known about current events and about the lives of others due to their fluency in the internet and in social media, and they become even more reflective and self-aware as a result of the pandemic. And also being forced to spend even more time online led them to create, to crave content that feels more realistic and more authentic to them, which has fueled the growth of platforms like TikTok and Be Real in what we've defined as the age of realism. Now through the focus groups that we conducted, we identified six core tenets of this generation. The first is information. Gen Zers have so much power at their disposal because they've grown up with the internet and with social media, and they know how to use it to find what they want to look for. The second is identity. They want to be unique and seen as individuals, which they do so by trying to hone a personal style and by only selectively following trends. The third is improvement. Gen Z values personal growth and they want to express it in their fashion choices, including by eventually trading up to higher quality items. The fourth is ideology. Gen Zers have strong principles, even though their fashion choices might not always align with their stated values, especially when things like price are a factor. Fifth is introspection. Gen Z is making sure that mental health and well being are no longer taboo topics, and they're demanding that brands and retailers take a stand and be a part of this conversation. And last but not least is informality. Having grown up surrounded by athleisure and informal dress codes, continued remote and hybrid work post pandemic will mean that Gen Z's wardrobes will further blend work and play. Now, these six core tenants are the basis for the six Gen Z personality clusters. Quilt AI used a machine learning model to identify and to group key Gen Z trends to come up with these clusters. Then the company curated more than 500 Gen Zers public social media profiles and analyzed over 5,000 of their posts to allocate each into a cluster and then measure their level of adherence to these six tenants. These results were then sized and extrapolated to represent the broader US Gen Z population. And you can see the percent of the total population that each cluster constitutes here um, beneath their names. So at a high level, these clusters include forgers who are ambitious and confident and pursue unconventional goals, signalers who crave external validation and traditional symbols of success and status, satellites who want to fit in and are the cluster that are most likely to follow trends, rebels who enjoy dark humor and dismiss status-seeking behavior, explorers who have an atypical mindset and yearn for adventure and for independence, and idealists who have a strong sense of purpose and responsibility, but are also realistic about the limits of their activism. And of course, we do have to recognize that these clusters are only high level and are just meant to better understand Gen Zers, who are in fact extremely multifaceted and often exhibit characteristics of multiple clusters. We complemented our social media analysis with a proprietary survey of Gen Zers in the US. One noteworthy finding that came through from this was regarding the purpose that Gen Zers say fashion plays in their lives. We found that for most Gen Zers, <clears throat> fashion is important for how it makes them feel. And they prioritize confidence and expressing their identity far more than they do showing status or following trends with their fashion choices. Instead, many Gen Zers experiment with trends only selectively while they try to hone their own personal style. This comes as Gen Zers are inverting the design process and accelerating trend cycles. Many popular Gen Z trends like coastal grandma or the cottage core aesthetic originate bottom up from user content instead of top down from the fashion system. And this constant demand for new social content causes trends to form and move faster than ever, which makes it especially hard for Gen Zers to keep up with trends. Now, given these and the countless other insights on Gen Z that we uncovered through this project, we found that fashion companies must devise strategies to captivate young consumers around four key pillars which are going to be the main topics of our moderated conversation. And these pillars are brand communication, brand style, brand communication, 
and brand evolution. Uh, to learn more about the findings of our data and analysis on Gen Z in full by accessing our report, as well as to find other ways to engage with BOF Insights, including our membership offering and our bespoke advisory services, please visit shop.businessoffashion.com. Now, we'd like to turn it back over to our panelists to hear their thoughts on what fashion really needs to know now about Gen Z in the age of realism. Perfect. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for showing that modified extract from the report and also for teeing up the conversation right now. So for the benefit of our listeners, we're going to be revisiting those four pillars that we said needed to work in concert. So that is namely brand communications, brand style, brand communities, and brand evolution. And an important thing to keep in mind is that evolution actually cuts across the first three pillars as well, because clearly you have to be tailoring your messaging, you have to be refining your product while finding your style or honing that brand DNA, and also being able to congregate and to nurture and build those communities. So that is all very much a part of brand evolution. So something to keep in mind as we progress with the conversation. But let's tackle them in order. So let's start with brand communications. And Shaina, I wanted to start with you because from your vantage point at Juve Consulting, Surely there's going to be a lot of brands and retailers that come to you, and there might be a number of misconceptions. So it'd be really interesting for us to hear what are some of the biggest misunderstandings that fashion companies have with regards to being able to connect with Gen Z authentically. Yeah, thank you for that question, Diana. So the first thing that I want to ground my response in is an acknowledgement of where Gen Z is and what our psyche has been formulated by, right? At Juve, we say that Gen Z is a generation of memes and movements. And what that is defined to be is that, yeah, we care about pop culture and what Kim Kardashian is wearing and the hot gossip that we see on Twitter and Instagram, but simultaneously are rooted in this belief that our upbringing was at a time where there were moments of trauma and also realizations of what the political and socioeconomic landscape looked like that really shaped the way that we view the world around us. Whether it was 9-11 and seeing our parents um, go through the financial crisis in 2008, a global pandemic, foreign conflict, um, the biggest racial justice movement that we've seen in US history has shaped the way that we see not only ourselves, but brands, corporations, institutions, and governments show up for the causes and things that we care about. So we never had the luxury of not knowing what was happening in the world because of the media landscape. And we define Gen Zers to not only be digital natives, but social media natives, right? Which is something that Ben already touched on. And I think where we see a disconnect is what brands believe our beliefs to be versus what they actually are. So brands think that we care about sustainability, about having no disposable straws, um, a shift in reusable water bottles, secondhand shopping in terms of even the fashion landscape but there's a lot of subversive discourses that define Gen Z. Our beliefs actually are that there is no ethical consumption under, under capitalism, that there's eco-anxiety that we feel, that there's existential dread and climate guilt that we've seen in the trajectory of our lives thus far. And what that means for brands is that we're going to see performative actions when they come out um, in terms of your brand, your marketing, and even the way that you're setting up your values ecosystem, right? Um, this idea that there's a difference between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. So whether we're looking at things like social justice um, advocacy that brands have to do in, in wake of what the political landscape might look like, or even if we're looking at things like sustainability initiatives, it's not just a matter of saying these are band-aid solutions that we're now acknowledging. It's also a matter of touching on how have these things at times been issues that brands have attributed to? What is the accountability there? And how do you authentically show up, not for every single issue, but for the issues that really matter to you? and in a way that feels really authentic to Gen Z, that is about personality and personas, and not just um, these ideas that we have in terms of our PNL or goals and objectives that we think Gen Z cares about. Um, just because you saw the word slay in an advertisement doesn't mean that it's going to resonate with Gen Z, um, because we also have to acknowledge the communities and groups that that terminology comes from. It's Black and queer folks that are setting culture, so there needs to be a level of appreciation and understanding and not just a assumptions that brands are making. That's perfect. And I think it's a beautiful encapsulation of why we call Gen Z is in the age of realism. So it's all about that hyper awareness. And therefore, there's a disavowal of social media that's overly idealized and overly filtered. But and just to touch on the point of, you know, when a company might come to you to ask about, okay, like, how do I best communicate with Gen Z? Like, clearly, from what you've just said, it sounds like it has to be a long term exercise. But generally, from your experience, what do you think is kind of the, the amount of time that needs to elapse in order to be able to write that ship in order to kind of course correct and make it so that it is genuinely connecting with Gen Z. 
Yeah, I think it's immediate, right? The reality is that Gen Z can do their homework. We're using social media to perform for our identities, to do our homework, to call companies and brands out. And I want to acknowledge that I think every generation has pushed the status quo. Like we are not unique in wanting to disrupt the world around us. But what is different is that social media allows us to galvanize unlike ever before. And digital implements have become tools for us to access and have reach. So because Gen Z is going to be able to like, go on your website right now and be like, well, you claim to care about, you know, EDIB, but I don't see that your corporate board structure is diverse. Um, you claim to care about specific issues around sustainability and empowering underrepresented communities in fashion or highlighting new and upcoming designers, but you only see the people that have already had access and privilege be the people that are now being highlighted. How do you find those cultural tastemakers and put in the effort to reach audiences that you wouldn't typically necessarily um, have the reach for is I think what Gen Z now ex expecting out of brands. Um, and that means that you need to know your mission and your why, right? I don't expect a brand to that's necessarily focused on um, fashion that in terms of gender fluidity to now start commenting on uh, issues of, you know, like racial inequity, if that's not necessarily in their brand purpose. However, we've reached a point where issues like that are things that companies have to reckon with because even internally, there are tensions of race that we're seeing in the workplace. So I think there's some issues that you just can't shy away from but that also does does mean that internally if you can't tell me as a brand what your one sentence why is and regurgitate that out into the open how do you expect your consumer to know that okay great so Craig, i want to turn my attention to american eagle and really big kudos there in the sense of during our survey what we discovered is that american eagle was one of the top 10 favorite brands listed by gen z and this was unprompted free response from the survey that Juve Consulting conducted on our behalf. So this was nearly a thousand individuals across the US. So clearly to be top of mind in that way for US Gen Zers, it means that American Eagle is doing something right. And so I think this is a really good segue to be able to understand how American Eagle is actually leveraging UGC, which is user-generated content, as well as Gen Z brand ambassadors. Yeah, it's interesting, Diane, as I reflect back on my career, I've been in this seat at Calvin Klein, Abercrombie & Fitch, yes, the old school Abercrombie and Fitch and Gap. And I grew up as a high touch, high control lifestyle marketer. And just to build on what um, the previous panelists said, you have to let go. And, and we have let go in terms of, of how we bring our, our brand to market. And so we have a tops down, bottoms up creator and influencer strategy. Our scale allows us to work with some of the biggest creators out there. Think Addison Ray, think the kids from Outer Banks, think tennis star Coco Goff, but some of the best performing, most engaged with, most action-oriented content actually comes from our store associates. So we have a 35,000 store associates, a vast majority of them Gen Z, a vast majority of them diverse. Um, and we've created an internal um, social um, influencer community. Um, and, and that just tells us that, yes, Gen Z still does want to be inspired. And we believe that 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 we can be that source. But at the same time, they're inspiring us and, and quite honestly, leading us on our customer brand journey. Okay. And how does that feel to go from a more centralized planned approach to marketing to life safe fair? So what does a company need to be able to do in order to accommodate that kind of shift? Dude, it's scary. I'm, I'm just going to be blunt. It's scary. But having said that, I think that companies that do it well have to embrace the fact that um, you're, you are going to take some risks. You are going to have some failures you are going to bump into some hot button issues that you're going to try to navigate together with your community. Um, and I think that we have done a better job than many brands in, in, in doing that out there. Um, and, you know, I think we are extremely active on the platforms that Gen Z is active on. And so, for example, on TikTok, which, as we all know, is probably the number one most preferred platform right now, 90 plus percent of our content comes from creators, comes from UGC. We tried, we have huge budgets and we've tried branded content. It falls flat. They want to see themselves. They they want to see their their heroes. And, and the cool thing is that many of those creators are coming from nowhere, right? So I'm just reflecting on Addison Ray. Here is a typical kid from suburban Louisiana. And now she has a bajillion followers on, on TikTok. And we could go through other lists of that as well. So 
Um, and, I, and I think also reflecting the diversity, not just ethnicity, but the diversity of interest have been something that has been very effective for us as well. So of course, we're going to lean into style and fashion, but why not gaming? Why not sports? Why not cause? Um, why not impact? Um, why not music? Why not other things? So I think that's something that we've done quite well at as well. Okay, thank you for that. Now, Anurag, we were really grateful to Quilt AI for the very detailed machine learning and the AI models that were applied in order to come up with the clusters and also to be able to identify how those clusters indexed against those six tenants, which were the introspection to informality that Benjamin alluded to earlier. And very interestingly, Quilt AI also analyzed the clusters against a seventh criterion, which was on irony. So I would love for you just to be able to describe to the audience what were some of the key findings when you applied applied irony and kind of understanding how Gen Zers use that as a mode of expression on social media. It's, it's um, you know, I, I got, a, I, so I, I have a company that has an average of 23.4 um, and including me and my co-founder in that data set. So, you know, we, we, we lean very, very Gen Z and I'm texting my daughter who's 12 and then cutting edge on the bottom end of the Gen Z spectrum. And she sends me a skull back a few weeks ago and I don't know what the skull was. And so I'm, I'm asking my colleague, what is a skull? Um, and then I get it and I'm dying of laughter. So, all right. So, and there is this, this thread that exists through all my colleagues and all the Gen Z pieces of work that we do and, 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 and my daughter, which is this self-mocking, self-deprecation, dark humor that is so cool. There is very little pretense. Um, there is an ability to make fun of yourself. There's an ability to make fun of the world. You know, Shaina mentioned something about the, the curve, right? You went through the 2008 crisis, you saw 9-11 from a parent's perspective, and you see in Ukraine, you saw the pandemic. So there's this ability to laugh at stuff, and, and that is brilliant. So in, in, you know, it's either British humor that's taken over the world and, and taken over Gen Zs, or it's just this you know, innate way that they have of being able to not let stuff get to them and be able to send so again, Shaina talked about memes and moments, memes and movements. And memes are massive, right? So we, you know, when, when we machinically analyze data, we're constantly updating the machine on a weekly basis just to keep up with memes and meanings across across that. So um, my favorite part of Gen Zs, honestly, is is the irony and the humor. They are hilarious. And I'd love to ask this of all three of the panelists, but are there specific examples of brand campaigns or um, situations where a, a fashion company has been able to leverage that kind of sarcasm and dark humor that jumps to mind. So I don't know, Shina, Craig, if anything is um, coming to light for you with regard to that question. I, I can say that here at AE, we're living it right now. So we are the number one selling men's underwear line here in the US. Some of these uh, some of these designs are very provocative, but to to uh, you know in a humorous way. Um, and if if you went on to our Twitter, you would see how much fun that our community is having with honestly designs that make me blush as a Gen Xer. Um, and and but we embrace it. We're just having fun with it. And I think that that is a side of our brand that, uh, again, uh, we've we've leaned more into our community, their response in, in doing things like caption this when they when they see one of those, I mean, very, very pushed um, men's underwear designs. Okay, I'm going to have to Oh, the quick example that I was just going to share before we move on in the next uh, question and, uh, is probably around Crocs uh, and the idea of like really accepting what your product is and what your brand is and then pairing that with collaborations. Like Gen Z loves an exclusive drop um, moment and we want to feel like we got something before everyone else did, right? The life cycle is a little bit shorter, but Crocs are comfortable. Um, so I've heard, I'm yet to purchase one and you can put your own pin and express yourselves however you want, but whether it's SZA or KFC, I think being able to take the chewiness of a brand like Crocs and reinvent that to be relevant is a great example of how brands can like own up to who they are, right? And really lean into that rather than shying away from it. 
Okay. I love that. And it is a really good segue to that second pillar around brand style. So as Benjamin indicated in that report extract, we saw that Gen Zers have really inverted the design process. They are accelerating the trend cycles. So Craig, I wanted to start with you because you're coming from the industry perspective and clearly the traditional fashion model is one in which it takes weeks or even months before product hits the shelves. So I wanted to ask whether it's specific to American Eagle or more generally for fashion companies, how does one think about that balance between novelty and having something new for your consumers versus staying true to your brand ethos? A couple of things come to mind. First of all, from a product perspective, trends move so quickly with Gen Z that you have to tap dance through your day and figure out what's now and what's next. And I think the best brands are using the art of curation of existing product to tell that story. So it's Barbie core today, it's God knows what tomorrow. Um, but that curation helps us go, go very quickly. But I also think from a marketing perspective, playing on some of these um, evolving platforms is fun as well. In the green room, we were talking about the fact that just on Monday, American Eagle was one of the first brands to join Be Real. We've actually been very open with our audience that we don't even know how this is going to go, almost saying, come watch the train wreck that could be AE on Be Real. Um, and we've had some fabulous engagement over the last two days. On Roblox, we are now the second most visited brand activation next to Gucci, 50 million unique visitors. The fun thing there was that more than 30 million people have actually tried on AE clothes for their avatar. Um, and again, that is a little bit out of our comfort zone, maybe not you know the traditional um, uh, product calendar or marketing calendar that, that one, one has in one of these larger companies. But I think that off the cuff, let's be a little bit flexible, let's be a little bit nimble has really helped us. Okay, makes sense. And China, was that survey finding surprising to you? So when Ben kind of showed that uh, results around how Gen Z engages with fashion, what are the reasons for engaging with fashion? And trend actually ranked quite low on that totem pole. So what's your take about Gen Z and trends? I think Gen Z ultimately wants to be able to express themselves and things like fashion are one way of doing that, right? And one of the things that I think uh, Craig has done such a wonderful job about talking about is with UGC is this idea that if you're naturally going to show up for a brand, you want that brand to number one, see that you have an affinity for them, even if it is a trend. And secondly, that there's an element of loyalty. And I think a lot of brands are struggling with understanding, how, okay, someone made a one-time purchase, how do we get them to come back? 80% of Gen Zers have downloaded a retailer's um, app, but that doesn't actually lead to retention over time. So I think this idea of even, for example, like being really bold and innovative, right? If you're getting on Be Real for the first time, like I know the founders of Be Real and from what they've told me, they're like, we don't personally want to, even when they're thinking about brand engagement, it's like the brands come to them with the same questions around the UI UX of the platform when they're like, all we really want people to do on that platform is to take risks, to almost guarantee incentives, to say that if you did post a Be Real in real time outside of our stores, like you get a five minute shopping spree to get whatever you want for free, right? Like building loyalty in ways that are meant to be bold and creative and also incentivize you to want to make UGC. That if you're seeing the same people show up and comment on your brand, engaging with them in the, in the TikTok comment section, right? Sending them a DM and a, or like a PR package because they're not an influencer. They're the best authentic word of mouth for you to say that there's someone that is resonating with you. So I think Gen Z is really looking from a fashion lens even to talk about self-expression, to own up for the brands that they love. And there's a, there's a reason why even when you look at the report that there's the top Top three brands that resonate with Gen Z are the brands that have effectively done that, right? The ones that have really built a sense of community for Gen Z, as well as a place for them to curate, to create, and just express. Because even on social media, we're seeing a shift from curated aesthetic feeds to a photo dump of like your foot and what you had for breakfast and an orange peel, right? So it feels like it's a really random amalgamation of things, but in reality, it's just the way that we now choose to express ourselves. Great. I think that's so interesting because now we can see how that brand evolution does tie into other pillars around brand style because now we're talking about TikTok or Be Real in terms of just those channel shifts. 
And so Anurag, I want to turn over to you and just talk a little bit about trends at a macro level, because Quilt AI, you know, from your vantage point, when you do the analysis, you're looking across the U.S. in terms of public social media profiles. And it'd be really interesting just to get some of your synopsis about what are some of the key trends that the different clusters have been buying into. So you can tackle it from kind of what are some of the most interesting differences or what are some of the similarities that are transcending clusters? So feel free to take that question and run with it. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and thread, thread that through. For me, one of the interesting things that popped out when we did the piece of work was the fact that this generation is incredibly pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they want to be activists, but not too activisty. Yes, they want to be trend forward, but not too trendy. Yes, they're driven by, by sustainability, but that doesn't drive everything. So style is important. So there's this level of um, sophisticated maturity that is, is, is a first. So they had to come think about the millennial generation. There's a, a tremendous amount of conversation about, say, climate. Gen Z realizes they may not be able to dent the arc of the universe, but they're pragmatic about the things that they can do. So yes, are they leaning into donations and and um, and re repurposing stuff? Yes, but they're not going overboard on it. So the largest trend that I find is just the the level of authenticity. And I know it's a super overused word, and I I I just did it again. But the level of authenticity is is refreshing. It's it's clean, and I think brands such as such as Craig's brand, um, if they can tap into that, it's just easy being yourself. And this this trend that we see because of TikTok is even cooler. So again, bringing it back to my daughter, um, she's showing TikTok to my dad. Right, it's like this this Gen young Gen Z, almost Gen Alpha, talking to, to a boomer, and she talks about. And the first thing out of his mouth is, "So I don't need to worry about what my friends did here." It's like, no, just like hang out. You know, and 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 she posted what TikTok is said at the same time, and and that large trend of being easily authentic, not being worried about judged, um, and the rebel the rebel um, uh, persona is my favorite because they like they're a little bit like the Star Wars rebels, which you know is a is a boomer comment to make in some ways, but they they don't really care. They're they're easy, they're comfortable, they're fighting a cool fight, but they're also pragmatic about how they how they win in a certain way. So that's that's the largest trend that I think will have to just finally be authentic as brands, and we'll we'll see more and more brands getting comfortable with discomfort as this as a speak to Gen Z. All right, thank you for that. So we've been addressing cultural trends, and um, if we turn our attention to fashion trends, was there anything in particular that you thought was kind of a commonality or an interesting differentiator between the cluster? So, for example, kind of you know from what Benjamin was highlighting earlier about the satellites being the most likely to follow trends and that, you know, there is sort of a more of a community minded approach versus the rebels who are very not that. Um, but were there any sort of trends that you saw as being having the potential to stick around? Because one thing that we observed in our research for the U.S. is that, you know, back in the 90s and early 2000s, the U.S. really had more of a monoculture. So everybody watched the same TV shows. We all ate the same cereals. We kind of had the same cut of genes. And, you know, skinny jeans were kind of top of the world for however many decades and now the trends have in terms of fashion trends have really really picked up the pace so I don't know if you from your research at Quilt AI have identified any trends that you think might have the staying power oh on rock sorry am I the only one who cannot hear I can't hear either. either yeah oh. Anurag, I'm so sorry. I think you cut out. Uh oh, okay. Okay, while Anurag is sorting out some technical issues, Craig, maybe if I can ask that fashion trend question for American Eagle and just have an understanding of what are some of the styles or fads that American Eagle has actually decided to buy into that you're you know, trying to make something and, and make it into like a, a moment. Yeah, Diana, I think you hit on that jeans point and in, in, in very effectively, meaning a company like American Eagle would normally come out with, this is the it gene of the season. Let's all lean into that. The reality is Gen Z doesn't really want to be told what to lean into. They, right. they, they want to drive this conversation and, and drive the trend. And so you're seeing companies like ours come to the market with a range of, of washes, a range of fits that they can express themselves in. And honestly, sometimes they are, they want to express three or four different parts of themselves. Um, and, you know, I guess good news, bad news, right? You know, so much of this is for the TikTok. So much of this is for the Insta. Um, you know, the good news for a company like American Eagle is that they 
they tend to invest and care more about sustainable practices that AE is putting into their bottoms, their their jeans, their cargos, their whatever. And you know, in, in my humble opinion, unfortunately, that has led probably to some fast fashion craziness on tops. Um, but I just think again, this diversity in choice is something that that um, you know a larger company like ours has to has to consider. All right, that's that's really helpful, and not just for for big corporations such as yourself, but even on an individual level. I thought about should I do a middle part because that's what Gen Z is more, you know? Because yeah, yeah, I, I I get it. Um, Arnaud, back to you, just to kind of give you a chance to finish that off. Fingers crossed that the sound is coming through now. I hope so. Yes, perfect. Yes, all right. excellent. So I, I think the 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 coolest part about the community finding that we got from a trend perspective across all different personas and all different segments was that. Everybody actually wants their own version of community. So Gen Z has multiple different communities. So you have the signalers, they want a status seeking community. The rebels want a community that is the outsider community. And so, so brands have to find a way to have different community experiences for different Gen Z segments. And that's a very different experience in brands. I'm going to build a community and to the point I'm going to have an app and download it and everyone's going to get the same offer. But if you, if you don't interact with different segments of your customer group in different formats and create these micro communities. And I think that's the main trend that I'm seeing is micro communities that are extremely vocal, extremely intense, um, and are able to engage on, on certain topics. And, and a signaler talks about, about status, a, a forger talks about things that they're building. So it's a builder community. And, and that's the biggest learning that a brand is to take away that, that, and then I think that trend is here to stay. It's groups of smaller people as opposed to a mass mass approach that we've seen so far. Great. And thank you for shifting us gears to that third pillar on brand communities. And um, is there anything else that you'd like to elaborate on just with regard to how a brand or a retailer can look at those clusters that come out of a report and then say, okay, what are the most relevant clusters for my company? And if I think about building those communities, what are the magnets that I can use to basically attract those clusters and build those communities out of those? I think Craig's, I mean, not to punt it, but I think Craig's probably more qualified to answer that question. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a couple things that are important. If, if you're on the brand side, you know, I think you do have to understand what your brand stands for. Um, and, and for us here at American Eagle, we're leaning into passion pillars of, of Gen Z. We lean, to, we lean into five of them. So not everything, because we can't be everything. Um, and then we develop uh, marketing strategies, creative and content around that. Honestly, though, it's an explosion. I think back to, I mean, literally five years ago to what we are having to create today to stay relevant and stay engaged. There's about 500 pieces of content every week coming out of our machine. Um, and again, it is it is micro-targeting different segments of our, of our Gen Z population. I also think that as a brand, we're in the entertainment business as well. Um, and so um, when when we look at our Gen Z customer, they they are revenge living to some extent. Um, you know, they were they were held back um, in the course of of the pandemic. So they are out and about and have returned in a big way to physical retail, which has helped a company like like ours. Obviously, they're doing that with their with their mobile device with them. So how do you bridge that gap? How are you the most entertaining and engagement brand? And then how do you lean into passion points that you really stand for is some of the advice that I would give. All right. China, what does community mean for a Gen Zer such as yourself? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Even, you know, Gen Zers can be bad with technology. So I think we've seen the sentiment that in, across companies, right, that first you wanted to be audience first, and then it shifted to digital first. And the way that I think about really effective branding, marketing, and just company purpose is by being community first. So this idea of community in practice, though, and not as a buzzword, I think has evolved for Gen Z to mean everything from our intimate interpersonal relationships up until our relationships with media, with personalities, and with the things that we have a national affinity for, right? When I was 14, I ran a One Direction fan page. I thought I was going to hit Mary Zane and Harry uh, somehow at the same time, and I had a few posts go viral. But even then, when I was with that fandom community of sorts, I had digital interactions and my 
my internet besties that I still wanted to meet in person. So one of the things that we talk a lot about at Juve even with brands is this idea of being digital, right? That your communities are digitally the ones that you can interact with in real time simultaneously when you're multitasking on Twitter DM and texting and FaceTime. But at the same time, we have this insatiable feeling that we want to meet with people in person. We want to be able to hug you, to talk with you and converse with you. And that community actualizes by going from the digital space into an in-person space and defined as this idea that we've talked about briefly in between what Anurag and Craig have said, right, of Gen Z wanting it all, that there's moral inconsistencies in our behaviors and also in our sentiments because there aren't the right options for us in the moment, that we want things that are fast, convenient, met with this natural juxtaposition of what is actually good for the environment, good for the world. And until a brand, right, comes up with an accessible, um, well-priced option that is sustainable, we're going to see these moral inconsistencies more and more in between Gen Z. So I think in that same vein, right, we want options when it comes to um, the idea of brands reaching our communities and also in terms of even the content that we're consuming, right, like the cultural tastemakers that we follow feel like our best friends to us. And I think that's something that's also leaning into community now, that influencers and small micro creators have such a strong uh, engagement level with Gen Zers because they feel like people that are exactly like us, that are humorous, that um, are talking about content in a really easy, simple way that translates over for us. And we're excited for them, right? Like when our favorite creators get a brand deal, we're not like, why is this inauthentic or something that um, they're put, put, putting as a sponsored post. Instead, we're like, get your bag, like good for you, like get the brand deal. It's exciting for us because we feel really invested with them. So I think this notion of community is translating over for brands, for creators, and and even within our personal communities, for example, when we're on our close friends story on Instagram, that's our inner circle. That's an inner community that we're still using digital platforms and social media to perform with. I think that's such a good observation. And we definitely saw that as well over the course of our research, where we saw that, you know, Gen Z, obviously digital natives, so very fluent with the internet and social media, but there's still that craving for real world experiences. And very much there is that kind of less of a delineation between the physical and digital worlds, as you may have seen in older generations. And China, I also wanted to ask you, because one of the interesting discrepancies that we saw between our focus groups and our surveys is that um, in the survey for the unprompted free response, when we asked about top favorite fashion brands, a lot of the names that came up are actually some of the biggest in the industry, whether it's Nike or Gucci or American Eagle. So these are heavy hitters. But then over the course of our focus groups, we actually teased out that a lot of Gen Zers have a desire to support more niche independent brands that might have marginalized or underrepresented designers. And I just wanted to ask, you know, and, and Craig and Anurag, feel free to answer this as well. But what do you think kind of explains some of that um, kind of how do we reconcile those two? And what is the power of those? big brands like is it related to the community it's a great question i think the first point is just that like, honestly i think a lot of traditional research mechanisms feel archaic when it comes to gen z because our trends are shifting so quickly so even when you're thinking about a research methodology lens of like what are the inconsistencies between our what we're saying and believing i think both things resonate and reign true so to, to answer your question more directly i think the first thing is that like I think intimacy really matters to Gen Z. And what I mean by that is like, even for the big name brands that we um, have an affinity for, like when they do a collaboration or if there's a specific designer that's attributed to them, like being able to name them or naming even the celebrities or the influencers that are then affiliated with a massive brand is important for Gen Z. And I think those brands that are in the top tier of the ones that Gen Z thinks about, that's the first point of relation that we have is that we can name the influencer, we can name the designer and we feel personally invested in it in some way, shape or form. I think the second piece of that with more like mom and pop stores or um, more uh, small scale businesses and fashion houses is that um, we believe in this idea of the underdog mentality right, that we want to be able to see that our money and our capital is making an impact. And you see that most resonating with brands at, that are at a smaller, you know, scale. And I see someone commented about Depop and Shein, but even to the point around Depop and Poshmark, this idea of being restyled, of being vintage, of being upcycled are all things that Gen Z leans into um, because it feels like we're getting something that's personalized to us and something that we've personally also chosen for us. It doesn't feel like it's being marketed to us from a 
mass appeal lens. So I think some of those are some of the things that we see in terms of why Gen Z is choosing one or the other. And what reigns true is that access matters, right? And that's why big name brands are always going to be resonant with Gen Z, but choice also matters. And we get to make the most amount of choices when we're going to smaller fashion houses or to personal brands or to places that are actually at the forefront of gender fluidity, androgynous fashion, and making us rethink even our relationship and proximity to how we express ourselves using fashion as a conduit for that. Okay. And that actually reminds me just your point about intimacy and having, it feels like a person who is directly speaking to a Gen Z audience. And Anurag, it reminds me of one of the clusters around forgers where uh, what kind of unites the community there is very much around having an inspiring brand um, ambassador or kind of like the, the face of that brand. So whether that's Kim Kardashian for Skims or whether that's Selena Gomez for Rare Beauty, but it feels like that's an example of where a cluster is very much, even though it, there might be like big brands where it's fronted by a big name, it feels somehow a little bit more personal. So Anurag, I don't know if you have any comments that you'd like to add about this point around building communities and kind of how you tailor that specifically for Gen Z. Yeah, I, 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 I want to reiterate the fact that the, the piece that China said around there is shouldn't, there isn't an inconsistency in the mind of Gen Z around a Nike and then a small fashion forward brand, right? So so that that sort of delineation, which was a very Gen X thing to do, which is like commercial movies and then indie movies, like that's gone away, right? So you can like a commercial film and like an indie film, and that's cascaded down into fashion in the way that you can like Nike and you can like, a, you know, all birds, you know, something that just came out of nowhere and only as a community, but doesn't have a product. So we see that clearly we see in the Forger um, cluster, the cool part is that they, they have an association with the maker, the builder, and it gives you a sense of purpose and belonging to connect with co-creators. So co-creating is a large part of what brands can do with, with certain clusters and certain Gen Z folks. The idea that, that you will be one directional is very challenging for Gen Z. And that's when they move away, even from established brands. So accessibility for established brands is key. And then smaller brands being just around and being able to connect on, on an individual level is exciting for Gen Z. Got it. Thank you. So let's move on quickly to our very last pillar, which is around evolution. And we've already touched on this a little bit when it comes to how tastes change, as well as the different technological platforms like TikTok and the rise of Be Real. So Craig, I wanted to ask you this first in terms of how have you seen the online and offline communities of American Eagle evolve? So kind of, you know, kind of continuing on from the thread of communities, thinking about evolution, and then we'll broaden this out and we'll have Shina and Anurag jump in just about general concluding thoughts about evolution. Yeah, for a brand like American Eagle, which has always targeted that age 15 to 25 year old consumer, you have to constantly be aware of where the story is headed for the next generation. I think the biggest thing by far is Gen Z taking control over their own narrative. And, and we are just a simple part of that narrative. It is not a brand led narrative anymore. I think that that's the biggest thing. Listen, a, re a reminder, and again, I've been at both places, AE and our sister brand, Airy, defined real and, and being true to yourself, right? And, and a and f was the villain. Um, so, you know, Airy was the first out with no retouching uh, on, on their models. So they were the first out on, on embracing size inclusivity. That, and so you see other brands like Victoria's Secret um, and others trying to jump on the bad wagon. Obviously, the consumer will decide if they believe it or not. Um, but I think that realness uh, and that being true to yourself is something that that Gen Z is is also defined it, uh, by as well. Great, Shaina Anurag, any concluding thoughts on evolution? Uh, after Shaina. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, my segue would be uh, Jockey tied to what Craig said, right? This idea of co-creation and community tying in together, and that young people are going to call out BS when they see it, right? So whether it's greenwashing, rainbow washing, diversity washing, this idea of blank washing um, or lead to false impressions that attract con consumers and customers within Gen Z, but are also going to 
create a lot of skepticism, right? And I think at the end of the day, like Gen Z is betting the things that we choose to put our names next to because it's a reflection on who we are. And I don't, like we always say at Jube, right? That the personal is political, that um, how your theory of change actualizes or partisanship might be different, but there's a few fundamental th truths that reign true for Gen Z. And I think self-expression, equity, access are all things that Gen, Gen Zers across the board, regardless of where they are or who they are um, in terms of even their locality or things that they're really mindful of. And the right partners and the right brands in terms of an evolutionary sense will always be the brands that are co-creating with us rather than just co-creating to us. And the only thing that I that I can add to that is that as you know, think about Gen Z transitioning to Gen Alpha. Um, mm -hmm. So Craig, you're going to see some Gen Alpha very soon, about three and three and a half years here. And and the cool part is that the level of authenticity is only going to get amplified, and the level of transparency that brands will have to deliver is massive, because information arbitrage, knowledge arbitrage, fashion arbitrage will disappear. And that mm -hmm. will become an even more complex reality for brands to live in as as they as they evolve. Mm, I love that. Okay, so very forward looking. So thank you all, Benjamin. Over to you for leading our audience Q and A. Perfect. Yeah, thank you um, to all of you. This fascinating conversation. I was so engaged. I'm sure our audience was too. Um, and a lot of them are pretty eager to get on screen to ask their questions. So now we are going to invite some of our audience members on screen. Um, please note that there may be a slight delay as we wait for them to come on. And first up, we are going to have Daniel in North Carolina um, come on to ask his question. Oh, Daniel, you're on hey, mute. Daniel, you're on mute right now. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I'm Daniel, and I'm currently a student at UNCG uh, doing a master's on gender neutrality, the supply and demand of it. Now, I know, uh, Shannon, you kind of mentioned gender neutrality. So my question is, um, how do you see, or any of you, or any of the panelists, how do you see merchandising shifting towards being more gender neutral? Um, because like Gen Z is pushing that narrative of kind of being more inclusive. So do you see like the way we present product kind of being more gender neutral, less binary? Do you Who's that? Do you want me to answer? I, I I can definitely go there if you want me to start at start this out or or no. Craig, run with it. Okay, let's do this. Um, thanks for the question, Daniel. We have seen a fascinating and very advanced push from customers to buy across genders in our stores. So we guesstimate that now. 25% um, of our men's product is actually bought by women. Um, and we are beginning to see, especially on this baggy jean trend, that men are actually buying women's jeans. And we've styled it that way um, in our photo shoots recently. Um, and you know, when we when we put out briefs to the creators that we work with, they're very loose briefs. So if someone wants to express themselves in any way, we're cool with that. Um, so you, you've definitely touched on a point, right or wrong, um, we're not out there pounding our chest about this because we feel like this is an individual choice and this is naturally happening. I think there are other brands that are talking it up more and I know maybe maybe we should be, maybe we shouldn't be, um, but we're doing it very natural. And even if you just look in our social feed this week, you're going to see a lot of this um, 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 you know, cross wearing of, of, of different gender um, product, but we're not saying, hey, this is in this section or this is in this section. It's just like you do you and we're happy that you do you. I'm also happy to chime in with just the fact that, you know, like 34% of Gen Zers don't even identify as solely heterosexual and like 40%, almost 40% of Gen Zers say that they would like strongly agree that gender no longer defines a person as much as it used to. So already in terms of from an identity baseline, right, Gen Z is shifting this idea of what gender looks like and the binary. And I think the expectation for brands is also that there's an acknowledgement of how that trend is shifting, right? That means inclusivity isn't just defined to gender though, it's defined to size, it's defined to 
the shades that a makeup company has. And I think before there used to be a sentiment from brands that like we aren't catering to a specific niche or we acknowledge that we haven't done enough product innovation, but it's 2022, right? If we're having conversations about the metaverse and Web3 and new technologies and we can't even have the right shade match to your skin tone, that's a tension point and something that we're going to have to reconcile with. So I think the expectation more so is that we think about inclusivity, not just in terms of the binary that already exists, but in terms of all spectrums across the board. And that's where Gen Z is holding um, companies and, and, and brands accountable. And I think fashion is really at the forefront of that and pioneering that in terms of what we've even seen with like gender fluid uh, clothing or, or fluidity as a concept coming out. Um, at the same time, I think it's also important to be mindful of like, who are the arbiters of those trends, right? It is going to be a lot of mar typically marginalized communities um, and, and inspiration that comes from folks like those in drag and Black and queer communities. So I think also being able to amplify the people that have already done that work is the is at the um, onus of brands and um, fashion houses as well. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, so up next, we're going to have Andrea from Sao Paulo uh, come on screen to ask her a question. Is that slight delay I warned you about? everyone. Um, I'm Andrea from Brazil and I work with uh, Trend Forecast and I want to know something about Gen Z. Uh, is the fashion industry uh, ready for this diverse like uh, the queen universe and the transparency uh, that Gen Z claims a lot of about this? Can you repeat that? And I'm sorry. Yeah, and Andrea, I'm so sorry. I'm not, I'm not, you were cutting that in and out for me just a little bit. I'm not sure I understood the question. Okay. Uh, is the fashion industry ready for this diversity, like uh, the queen, queer universe and the transparency that then Gen Z claims a lot? I think that it was around uh, is the fashion industry ready to embrace or under Gen Z with Gen Z's claims around diversity and Gen Z's expressions of diversity. Am I paraphrasing that correctly, Andrea? Yes. So uh, I think they're getting there. Um, I don't think everyone's there as yet, but, um, but it, it's it, it, it's bound. It's 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 a movement that I think the trains left the station. That's expressions. That's definitely going to happen. Um, we've seen we've seen brands die not having kept up with some of this and having made some very large missteps in estimating the impact that a Gen Z audience will have positively or negatively for them. So are they ready? I would say probably not, but are they planning on getting ready? I certainly hope so. I hope so too. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Andrea. Well, sadly, we are reaching the end of our BOF Live today already. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our report, we encourage you to visit our website, shop.businessoffashion.com. Um, on behalf of everyone at BOF Insights and the whole Business of Fashion team, we'd just like to give a huge thank you um, to our three panelists today, Anurag, Craig, Shaina. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day um, to share your insights with us. I know our audience was absolutely captivated with anything, everything you had to say. Um, so thank you so much. And also to our audience, thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, if you would like to join us for future sessions, uh, we invite you to please check out the BOF Live calendar for more sessions. Uh, and finally, thank you to our BOF team for helping run this event. Um, and yeah, that's it for us today. Thanks everyone for joining and we hope to see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thanks for having us. <laughs>